You know, whenever Catholics discuss the question of papal infallibility with Eastern Orthodox, the topic of Pope Honorius often comes up. Pope Honorius was addressed at the Sixth Ecumenical Council, Constantinople III, and he was anathematized as a heretic. How does that work with papal infallibility? And how does that work with Catholics who claim Constantinople III actually taught papal infallibility? Well, take a look at this video where I tackle all of these questions. Enjoy. Not only did the Sixth Ecumenical Council teach papal infallibility, and not only did the Council Fathers accept papal infallibility, they also accepted the view that Pope Honorius did not teach heresy. You heard me correctly. The same council that is referenced here by Schneider as condemning the Pope for heresy is the same council who, in sessions prior to that, cleared the name of all of the popes from the charge of heresy. Let me just review that with you very briefly here. Here's from a letter from Pope Agatho, read at the Sixth Ecumenical Council, written to the emperor, read at the council out loud, and all of the council fathers accepted this letter. And they, in fact, explicitly wrote back to the Pope as part of the Council, and they explicitly accepted everything in the letter. And watch what the letter says. For this is the rule of the true faith, which the spiritual mother of your most tranquil empire, the Apostolic Church of Christ, has both in prosperity and in adversity always held and defended with energy which it will be proved by the grace of Almighty God, has never erred from the path of the apostolic tradition. Now, right there, it's very clear. The letter that the Council Fathers accept is saying that Rome has never erred from the path of apostolic tradition. That is, it has never taught heresy. Nor has she been depraved by yielding to heretical innovations. There you go. She has never yielded to heresy. But from the beginning, she has received the Christian faith from her founders, the princes of the apostles of Christ, and remains undefiled unto the end. So he's saying, Rome will always be faithful in its teaching. It will never teach heresy. It will be undefiled unto the end, unto the end of time. And this is based on Jesus' promise. It says, according to the divine promise of the Lord and Savior himself, which he uttered in the Holy Gospels to the prince of his disciples, saying, Peter, Peter, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he might sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Let your tranquil clemency, therefore, consider, since it is the Lord and Savior of all, whose faith it is, that promised that Peter's faith should not fail, and exhorted him to strengthen his brethren, how it is known to all that the apostolic pontiffs, the predecessors of my littleness, have always confidently done this very thing. Now, right here, who was one of Pope Agatha's predecessors? Well, Pope Honorius is one of those predecessors. And the Pope is very clearly at this council saying, all of his predecessors have been undefiled in their teaching authority. They have never yielded to heresy. And the council fathers wrote back, and accepted this. So anytime we bring up the claim that Constantinople III condemned Pope Honorius for heresy, you have to consider this is the same council who also claimed all of the popes, including Honorius, have never taught heresy. Now, is there a contradiction here with the council fathers? Did they change their mind? I don't think we have to resort to a contradiction. Here's one way to harmonize these two acts. Whenever they say that Honorius and all of the other popes have never taught heresy, they're talking about the teaching authority of the pope. 
in his magisterium, in his actual official teachings, he's never taught heresy. Later on, whenever they condemn him as a heretic, they do so as a judgment about Honorius in his private person, not in his teaching authority, not in his magisterium. In other words, they're making the distinction between Honorius as an individual and a private person, what we might call perhaps material heresy, where you're not aware that you're teaching heresy, but there's heresy there, um, versus actually teaching it in your magisterium. You know, a person could privately hold to heresy and not know it without actually teaching it. Um, <clears throat> and it's certainly the case that somebody like a pope could be misinformed on something. Uh, so unintentionally unaware that something he privately holds to is heretical. That's possible. And so what they're doing is they're judging Honorius in his private person, not in any of his teachings, not in any of his official papal acts, but rather just saying he privately held to a heresy unknowingly. Whereas in several sessions prior to this, they clear all popes, including Honorius, of any accusation that they have taught heresy. So there I just offered you, you a way to harmonize this without saying, you know what, these council fathers are just flip-flopping. They don't know what they're talking about. They're denying their own teachings that they just accepted in a previous session. Um, and therefore, they're unreliable and we can't even take their Christology seriously because they're all over the place. Without resorting to that conclusion. Uh, because at that point, I think that the uh, entire Six Ecumenical Council and its endeavors uh, would be called into question. Rather than resorting to that, I offer the following as a way to harmonize them. But it's clear they are not accepting the, the proposition that the Pope actually teaches heresy in his magisterium, because not only do they clear all the predecessors of Agatho, they also want to say this is impossible anyway, because the Roman see will be undefiled unto the end. So if they were to contradict themselves, they would be contradicting their own teachings. Now, did they make a mistake on a matter of fact? Well, they certainly did not make any mistakes on faith and morals. They were spot on of faith and morals and everything that they taught. But did they make a mistake in judging Honorius as a person? The answer is yes. Because, again, Pope John IV and others have already shown, and, uh, well, John IV, Maximus, and others have already shown that Honorius did not hold to monothelitism in any kind of way, and that information is based on a person who was in that privileged position to know it because he was the Pope's secretary who actually wrote down the letters. And if you just read the letters, it's clear what he's saying. He's not affirming one uh, will in Jesus Christ. He's saying that the two wills of Jesus are not in contradiction to each other, and also the uh, humanity of Jesus is not in contradiction or in conflict with some element of concupiscence because he doesn't have concupiscence. So that's kind of the nuances that take place there uh, in Honorius. And so to bring this up as an issue uh, or an instance of the Pope propagating doctrinal errors or even heresy is incredibly misinformed. And even uh, Anastasius Bibliothecarius, who was the papal librarian a couple centuries after Constantinople III, had noted and again, this is the papal librarian. <clears throat> he had noted that Constantinople III erred in its judgment about Honorius, not in its evaluation of teachings. They made no mistake there. They're infallible. But in their uh, judgment of him as a person, they an erred. And of course, no council and even no pope is infallible in matters of fact. They can be mistaken on those things. So a pope could be mistaken if he says uh, something about science, for example.
or if he says something about history his history could be factually mistaken or his understanding of science can be factually mistaken those are not protected by the holy spirit um so of course when a council evaluates a particular person they could err in their judgment of that person they're not erring in their judgment about the heresy or the doctrine but they could err in their evaluation of an individual that's no long that's nowhere protected by the holy spirit Thanks for watching. This was a video by Union Without Confusion, affiliated with God With Us Radio, an Eastern Catholic podcast designed to help Catholics understand the Eastern roots of the Christian faith. Thanks for watching.